Dr. Clark, thank you for joining me and, and participating in this video interview. I, I very much appreciate you coming here to share with us and our audience. Uh, for our audience, could you please introduce yourself? Well, first of all, if the doctor thing always makes me embarrassed. It's Dick Clark, Richard, if you okay. want to be that formal. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I do a number of things, but I'm a professor of educational psychology and technology at the University of Southern California. Uh, I'm also actually a professor of surgery recently, last few years, mostly because of the work I've been doing in medicine. Uh, I'll maybe talk a little bit about that later as we chat. But, okay. uh, and I direct a research center called the Center of Cognitive Technology. And uh, the center is really an exciting place. I would not have it, I think, if I hadn't been associated with ISPI over the years. Oh, because I think one of the things that my work with this, my, my sort of experience in this organization did was to get me extremely interested in trying to find ways to interpret, tease out of research, what I call the active ingredients of things that over and over again in different studies, different organizations, different people, different kinds of tasks have worked and then I think are ripe to be applied in some fashion or scaled up so that we could implement them more widely. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I started a research center that uh, basically took that on as its mission, went out and looked for, for funding, didn't have any trouble at all, interestingly enough. Mm. I mean, we've been well funded for a number of years. And, uh, and so uh, I, I managed that research center. Our, our niche, so to speak, as a center is that we often work for other research centers. We also do a lot of work for the military, for large organizations, some of the biggest in the world, actually. Uh, trying to make suggestions about from a, I guess you'd almost say from a, uh, oh gosh, what's the best term, kind of a consumer's union approach where mm -hmm. we try to be independent. Mm -hmm. We don't push our own research on people. We look at other people's research, try to summarize it, try to come to a conclusion about what the best evidence supports, and then make recommendations that are as operational and as, uh, as clear and descriptive as we can about how to implement these ideas and why it is that they work and what the evidence is for it. Yes, thank you. I've, I've been to your website and I, you have a lot that you share regarding your research for everyone. It's uh, free. You want to please let us know what's the uh, web address for that? Yeah, or it's at www.cogtech.usc.edu. C -O -G -T -E -C -H dot USC dot edu. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to HPT, Human Performance Technology? First of all, do you even call it that or do you call it something else? No, no, I, I actually think the, the word technology is a great word. I know it upsets some people mm -hmm. because there's a common meaning that people have attached to it, actually, that in, in more popular terms, that it, it relates to equipment, machines, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Technology, actually, the definition of the term is it's an application of science and experience to solving problems, which I think is absolutely perfect for what we do. I think there are some people also that object to the fact that many of us think of ourselves as kind of engineers for mm -hmm. performance. We apply science, we apply experience, we try to deal with problems and gaps and opportunities as mm -hmm. well, and, uh, and do the best we can with uh, applying science and expertise. So how did you come across HPT originally? In, at ISPI. Yes. I mean, I really have a huge uh, uh, debt to this organization. It, it was a, I think the people in this organization that took this HPT idea, particularly what I call, or what some people call gap analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, here we are, here's where we want to be, right. here's the difference between the two. What's the cause of that gap? And then want to close it. That was, believe it or not, I mean, that's a simple idea, and it, what did the kids say? Blew my mind. <laughs> really yeah, very powerful. I just went, wow. I saw it as a huge, huge solution to a major problem, I think, that a number of fields have, most particularly education, because mm -hmm. that's where I, well, it's not where I started, but it's where I ended up. God help me. Uh, because you almost have to be a missionary to work in education, I think. At least you have to have that inclination. But there was no, there's no, uh, focus in education on trying to diagnose problems. Hmm. And when you train people at the university to be doctors of education without showing them how to go out, how to identify a problem, how to analyze it, how to solve it, they basically walk out with a whole lot of solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm from where I started out in this field when 
the solution to training was programmed instruction. It was that long right. ago. Mm -hmm. And we, we liked it because it had solid evidence that it increased learning. It did it in less time. I mean, what's not to like about something like that? And so everybody went out asking, where can I apply programmed instruction? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, what's the problem that it solves and how do you recognize it? So that, that was my, I mean, that's the thing that I think was so exciting to me about. I wrote a book on it. I mean, one of many, I think, mm -hmm. that are out there. But uh, I, I think that's just an absolutely brilliant idea that deserves to continue to be developed over time. It's never going to be finished. It's kind of one of those open models that you can continue to add knowledge to and mm -hmm. continue to move along. Who would you say were your biggest influences in this world when you first came upon it? Well, kind of, you mean the HPT idea? Yes, uh huh. Um, well, you know, I think I, it would be a very long list of people because I talked to anybody that would talk to me. Uh huh. I, I mean, I was really curious about what everybody's view of this was. and. And one of the things that I was doing as I was talking to people, and I can't think of anybody I didn't talk to okay. about it that I met here, including yourself yes. when we were first together, and I remember some insights you gave me. Um, I, I came to the conclusion that, that the, one of the biggest problems in people's understanding of this was how they were analyzing performance problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was, the, what was the, the, uh, the analysis scheme that they had to do that? Well, now, it's important to know that at least towards the end of my, my education, I was trained as a psychologist. And so I was asking myself, from, the, from what I knew about psychology, uh, the psychology of individuals, the psychology of groups, the psychology even of organizations, mm -hmm. what kind of analytical scheme would be the best? And, uh, and I, I, so that was what I got curious about right away. And I came to a conclusion that works for me that I actually put my book, and I th actually the book is still selling after 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's being used by a lot of universities. I think a lot of people have improved on it, I hope. But I found an approach that I thought was, was really beneficial. So where did I hear about HPT? I think I can't think of a person that I've talked to or met that didn't actually are, chat with me about it. Are there any articles or books that you read uh, initially that you would recommend to others, some place to start? You know, um, no. And, and your, I, I your, in your book, say, your, the title of your, I have your book and I've read it, but I don't want to miss Turning Research title. into Results. And you wrote that, co-authored that with? I, yeah, I, I had a couple of co-authors actually. Uh -huh. uh, and and the, my co-author that I wrote it with is now dropped out of, of HPT entirely. Uh, only was in it for a couple of years when he was working for, uh, for um, uh, who was it? Hewlett Packard, yes, I think. Went with Keeney, mm -hmm. uh, and, and a number of other people who've been very active mm -hmm. here. So. Well, that is, a, a, of course, a good book for somebody to start in. But uh, um, the, as you explain HPT, Human Performance Technology, uh, to others, do you have a thirty-second elevator speech or spiel that you use to? Yeah, I think it depends them? a lot on who I'm talking to. Okay. Uh, for example, if it's a if it's a venture capitalist or somebody that's got money to invest, but I'm very interested in getting venture capitalists connected to people in this field who have great ideas. Uh, I think the problem we've always had is scaling what we do. Mm -hmm. I think we really do know a lot about uh, about how to how to solve problems, how to how to how to use this system. I don't so think you. Scaling. So if I were to talk to a venture capitalist, so uh, how would you? Uh, rec what would you recommend to me that I use to define this thing, HPT? Well, I, I think I'd be telling them that I think there are people here that have an extraordinary approach to going into an organization and analyzing problems in a very, very succinct, very evidence-based way, figuring out how to achieve goals and what kinds of strategies, what kinds of interventions would actually achieve those goals and what kind of measures they need to make that happen. And uh, I don't, I, I do, I, I've seen some people here at ISPI who've tried to do that, and tried mm -hmm. to scale it, and um, I haven't seen many of those approaches be as evidence-based as I'd like to see them. Mm. And so what I'd like to do is find ways to connect people with who want to invest in things that would be useful for organizations to people that have great evidence-based ideas mm -hmm. for actually implementing this model that we've all sort of contributed to and, and that's such a vital approach, I think. Uh, so that's my, that's my elevator speech for, for, for venture, capitalists. venture capitalists. 
if it's somebody who doesn't know this field at all, like a student coming, like in. a student, for example, I'd say, you know, if you're going to go out to work, uh, no matter where you're going to work, you're always going to have clients, you're always going to have people that you're giving advice to, that you're giving support to. Do you really have a system? Do you know of any system that would allow you to go into any situation where human beings work? Analyze what their goals are. Get a sense of where they want to, what what they want to accomplish, and where they are, and very reliably find very effective, evidence-driven ways to help them achieve their goals. In other words, to be able to diagnose problems or up or the, the the benefits that you could give to an opportunity that somebody wants to achieve, and be highly successful in doing that. Because if you want that, ISPI is the place to find it. I think HPT is the solution that you want. Regarding HPT and your own learning, uh, can you discuss a little bit about what uh, what you're conti continuing with your own learning on and exploring? Yeah, well, um, I guess in the, the work that we do at the center, we have this wonderful opportunity to kind of move around to a lot of interesting ideas, and we get paid to think mm -hmm. about them, which is, you know, <laughs> Ideal. I, I think I'd write a check myself. <laughs> if I would. But it, um, my current passion is for something called cognitive task analysis. And the reason for that is that as in the, in the last five or six years as we've been working for, for uh, organizations that have given us problems to solve, it's become really clear to us that most of what we do um, as consultants, as people that try to support performance, is uh, based on our expertise. In other words, based on what we've learned from our own experience over the years working with people, no matter what our age is, whether just getting started, whether we've been here a hundred years and are on our way out, mm -hmm. uh, everybody's got a lot of expertise, I think, that they've picked up, their own experience. And one of the things that, that I think has struck me like a polex is the insight that experts are about 70% unaware of how they do this wonderful analysis that they perform, this, these kinds of decisions that they make mm -hmm. that help them solve very, very complex problems. The, the reason for that apparently is just the way we're constructed as human beings. Mm -hmm. Our cognitive architecture requires that we can only think about very little at one time. So we have to depend on a, a, an area of our, of our brains that nobody knows much about, that we're not deeply aware of, but yet that controls most of our lives. It's what a lot of people call automated, non-conscious knowledge that that really makes our decisions, that actually helps us solve problems, that does most of what we do. Now the reason for these two systems apparently is that a conscious knowledge, which is what we're all aware of, is its purpose is pretty much to solve new problems, not mm -hmm. to deal with our past experience. And we apparently don't have a lot of ability to think and to learn things really quickly because if we did, at least some people suggest, we might learn really stupid self-destructive things. And, Mm -hmm. End our existence, so to speak. So we're filtering it. We're filtering. And, and so this automated expertise that we all have, which by the way was discovered by a Dutch guy named De Groot, I think, who studied chess masters, mm -hmm. found out that chess masters, the only way that they differed from novices in chess, uh, when the two were equal in intelligence, let's say, was that chess masters could show them any chessboard at any point in, a, in an actual game, you could show them 10,000 chess boards, actually, pictures of them, uh, with actually chess pieces on them. And then later, you could show them a chess board they hadn't seen and one they had, and they would, find, they would be able to identify 100% of the chess boards. Each one, they could tell you who was going to win the game, most likely, if they were the best player. Mm. And novices were random in their ability to identify chessboards. They'd see. So they have this incredible pattern matching ability that they're not aware of. They can't describe to you how they do it. Uh, they can't describe to you how they play the game, but they are incredibly successful at it. So, so this has major implications for those of us who do analysis and interview or observe subject matter experts. To me, it has implications for everything that we do. Literally, everything we do involves thinking, it involves problem solving. Mm -hmm. And uh, it appears that we are not, um, it, it, obviously it's most important when we try to tell other people what we do. And that happens most often in training. 
I so, think 70% to 75% of all the training in the world is done by subject matter experts. Right, which means they could be missing up to 70% of what is needed by a novice. Which means they are. I mean, the evidence is pretty, pretty heavy that it is. And mm -hmm. people that design training always work with subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. Most training, most instruction, most education is designed by experts. And so one of the reasons why people don't succeed, in my view, largely, is because they haven't got all the information they need to actually do what it is that that expert who is trying to help them, who intended to tell them everything, yes. simply wasn't able to. They can't if they wanted they to. Can't so, so cognitive task analysis is an approach, a methodology for what teasing this out of yes. these experts. Yes. Can you give us? Yeah, a, yeah it involves a over bunch. Of, well, first of all, on our website, we have a lot of information about this, obviously, and we're not selling anything. I want to be really mm -hmm. clear about this. Our, our primary goal here is to get people interested in it, get them using it, getting them building it more. But what it, what it right now involves, first of all, there's about 100 different versions of this, so you've got to be really careful okay. when you're out there. Somebody named Ken Yates, who worked at our center for a number of years, actually analyzed every one of them, found there were only six of them that were evidence-based. Mm. And out of those six, most of them were actually designed for what's called machine learning teaching okay. computers, mm -hmm. robotics, that sort of thing. So only a couple of them are focused on human mm -hmm. performance, human learning. Uh, there's a guy named Gary Klein, Klein Associates has a business where he does this actually commercially and so mm -hmm. on. So what it entails first is interviewing experts individually, one by one, and to get them to tell you step by step what actions and what decisions they take in order to accomplish a goal. Mm -hmm. Uh, we don't actually worry about the fact that we're only going to get 30% of information from each expert because okay. there's this really strange thing we found, which is that each expert is aware of different types of things that okay. they use to analyze or decide. So we, inter we finally need to interview three to four experts and we get about 80 to 90% mm -hmm. of the kind of mental analysis and decisions that people have to make. We then kind of capture that, we put it in a document, and then we do a trial and revise cycle with a novice who has to do that to see what's missing. Okay. We then go back to the experts and say, you know, we don't think you told us about this particular thing. And then they say, oh, well. So that helps with their recall. They can actually pull it up. Yeah, uh, yeah. If prompted in yeah, such a way. Yeah, apparently when when they're prompted, when they actually, but we don't know what to prompt them for until we actually right. go through Find a the trial holes. cycle. Yeah. But the trial cycles work pretty fast because we really do have all but about 10 to 15 percent by the time we interview four people. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we build that into training. Uh, one of the very conservative ways that this work is done, the, cons the research is done anyway, is that we take trainees that are trained by the experts that we interview and we then take the cognitive task analysis that we get from those experts and have it actually presented by different people or online, even mm -hmm. without a human being actually doing the instruction. And we test the impact of that training on those two groups and see which does better. Mm -hmm. And we've never found, a, a, well, our meta-analysis, our attempt to summarize all of the research on this shows that about 40% more learning from the cognitive task analysis group in about 25% less time. So it's, and this is even with surgical residents who these people are bright enough, you know, mm -hmm. you can beat them with a stick and they'll learn things. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the fact that they're learning it quicker and better and not making mistakes actually when right. they apply is a hugely important thing for all of us. So there are many resources on the Center for uh, Cognitive Technologies website. Um, where would I start? Is there a, an article in particular that it would be a good starting point? Well, we have everything from a one-page description. If you okay. Want a quick Do you recall the title of, of, this. of that? It's called CTA Brief. Okay. And uh, uh, all the way to two recent chapters that we wrote where we tried to summarize everybody's work on this, and it's pretty mm -hmm. clear. There's a separate section called Publications on our website. Yes. And the first, I believe, the first category of publications in that uh, page is cognitive task analysis. Okay. There's a chapter there called cognitive task analysis in the handbook, mm -hmm. in, in one of the handbooks, and that's actually our best review. We have another chapter we did for ISPI's handbook, mm -hmm. uh, the, the most recent one, which talks about uh, CTA and its its interaction with different kinds of design systems. Oh. So how it is that you do cognitive task analysis in a way that fits with 
some of what we know we call these new complex knowledge design systems that are developing out there right now. Mm -hmm. So that's I think that's one of my passions. There's one more if I could yes please wait a second. Um, we got very alarmed at the center when we went out to, we were challenged to go out to take a look at things that people call constructivism, discovery learning, yes. inquiry learning, those kinds of things. A lot of people come and ask questions, not about general performance, although there are some of that with motivation and things like that, but I think the primary concern is with training, with instruction, those sorts okay. of things. What we, we, we went out to look and we were alarmed at how often we felt that people were using discovery as a way to get people to either learn things or to solve problems at work. A more so, informal learning approach is that? Yeah, yeah, I guess that's one way that's to the do it. It, it involves word. usually giving people a challenge or giving them a question okay. and then putting them in a group and letting them figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. It's called by all kinds of names. John Seeley Brown calls it communities of practice. That yes. kind of dresses it up more. Um, uh, there are uh, constructivists have their own name for it. Discovery. Some people call it. There's a version of something called problem-based learning. Yes. It's actually used in medicine now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work all that well either. So we were alarmed at how not only how poorly it worked, but that there's 50 years of evidence that it doesn't work, and almost none that it does. So we said to ourselves, A, why are people doing this? But B, what's the alternative? Yes. So the alternative that we found that there is solid evidence for something called guided instruction. Uh, some people call it, well they call it by different names, but some people call it direct instruction. Yes. But it involves very simply showing people how to act and decide to achieve a goal uh, with an authentic problem that's drawn on the environment where they have to go and work and apply what they've learned. And then having them immediately do the hands-on application with a different kind of challenge while they're getting immediate feedback when their strategy kind of goes off in a, in a wrong direction. It's that simple, really. There's maybe a little bit more to it, but it's that. And so we have now, I have personally spent quite a bit of time in the last five or six years arguing against discovery and constructivism and inquiry-based learning and for this more fully guided mm -hmm. instruction that we find is what works exactly well. You mentioned authenticity here, and so can we shift uh, to that a little bit? How important is the the authentic context, the uh, uh, the information and demonstration and application kinds of uh, practice exercises? Uh, isn't there an issue with authenticity and its tra and and how well something transfers if I don't learn it in the context in which I'm going to apply it? Can you can you speak a little bit? Yeah, to that? I think there's a long history of this uh, discussion about this and. What I think we've learned recently is a bit counterintuitive, uh, and uh, it's a result of a, of a new theory called cognitive load theory. Yes, it's real. I mean, it's kind of taken over now, and it's the it's the gorilla in the hotel in psychology at the moment, and it'll get built up further, and then we'll find some alternatives. But basically, what it says is that because we can think about so little at one time that we have to be very careful about what information we give people when we want to modify their performance, when we want to teach them something, whatever. In other words, it's got to be, it's got to fit within this very small three to four items of information at once that people can handle. Mm -hmm. So in initial instruction, where we're demonstrating things, we want not to include a lot of sound and noise and kissing people on the cheek with videos and all these so wonderful things. But when they go out to apply and they begin to practice and do hands-on stuff, mm -hmm. now we want to start, once they begin to get a sense of what it is they're learning and can begin to, to apply it accurately, now we want them to start applying it in an environment which very closely represents the kind of problems they're going to be expected to solve when they come out. That then helps what a lot of people, there's different names for this, but some people call it uh, near transfer. Yes. All right. Well, we want more than near transfer, for mm -hmm. example. We want them to be able not only to apply it where we think they're going to be working, but where they can't now even imagine they might want to use this knowledge. So how do you get from the kind of setting the context and problems, more authentic problems that help near transfer, to this more adaptable, creative mm -hmm. kind of farther transfer that we've struggled with for so many years? And the evidence, I think, supports the use of a sort of what people call varied practice, but what it entails is creating scenarios that are increasingly different, different and complex. 
mm -hmm. and unusual. Different from my work setting. Where I think I'm going to be applying it now. or where So I first learned it in, my, in something authentic to my work right. setting and then I, I begin to vary that That's and take right. it further and further away. Yeah. Okay. So I think some of these new multimedia technologies are great ways to do that. Mm -hmm. I think simulations, ways to do simulations are, are a great way to do it. In other words, to, to be again to create very different kinds of applications of some kind of knowledge, even outside of the work environment, taking mm -hmm. it outside of work and applying it in context that somebody would never maybe even think of themselves as being engaged in, but only after they learn it in a more traditional kind of authentic work setting. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if I you have to learn... jump right to... If I have to learn active listening, I should probably learn active listening in my own work context in, in that, and then learn how to apply it in... Uh, uh, outside of that, outside. so that you know that you will eventually be able to do it in almost any environment, including, for example, with people that might be from different cultures who don't necessarily express mm -hmm. themselves the way you're familiar with, Yes, and so on and so forth. As, can you speak for a moment? This just came to me, uh, games and the use of games, uh, uh, serious games, and they're called different things here, but uh, um, what's the evidence for using games as part of a learning strategy? Well, we were asked to actually look at that evidence by the military, mm -hmm. spend B billions of dollars on games, actually. Mm -hmm. So we did. We looked at all of their evidence. We looked at every, all the research they'd done, well, at least of all of the inquiry they'd done about games. We looked at every study we could find published in a journal, mm -hmm. um, and we came to a very negative conclusion. I mean, I, we stated it in the following way, that, that we couldn't find any instance where a game had taught anything to anybody better or quicker or less expensive than some alternative that was going to be much less expensive, much quicker. So the big push on using, is it a, a fact, a matter of the authenticity of the game? It's not replicating or simulating no. my work environment? No. I think that's actually a benefit that, that some games provide, but it is that games are at their root. The definition of a game mm -hmm. is, is a discovery activity. Okay, yes. You see, I mean, I, the, well, here's one of the problems. There's a hundred different definitions of games out there. Mm -hmm. So when you start having this conversation, the first question you have to ask is, what do you mean by games? games yes. And people then begin to talk about genres of games, which don't matter, you know, first-person shooter or mm -hmm. so on. None of those matter, actually. Mm -hmm. The real issue is a game is primarily about discovering how to get from one level of a game to another, and each level is a set of goals that you have to achieve. Mm -hmm. Now that's the generic version. You can you can fill in any multiple examples. Games are different than simulations. Some people confuse the two. Okay. A simulation is a, a realistic depiction of the essential features of some system or process mm -hmm. or principle or whatever. And those are very, very, I think, effective at certain points in, in, in people's learning. In other words, to be able to form a model of how something works, something like lightning or um, how uh, some process in an organization works, it's really great to be able to simulate it for people. Okay. It helps them with hands-on practice when they can interact with the simulation. Mm -hmm. All those things, I think, are valuable in terms of this transfer activity we talked about before. Mm -hmm. But giving people a game to learn something is not going to teach them, it, except more expensively. Mm -hmm takes much longer time. I don't, and by the way, there's not even any research that games are more motivating to people. Ah. There is actually some research that they might lead people to invest less mental effort. Uh, back in the 80s, a guy named Gabby Solomon, who was my chair, a really influential guy with me, I think, a psychologist, a guy that got his doctorate at Stanford in a year, mm -hmm. one of these brilliant types, who did a study on Israeli and American kids and what, learning from television and film years, or television and books, I think it was, mm -hmm. years and years ago, back in the mid-80s. And Solomon's view was that Israeli kids had gone to school on TV, mm -hmm. whereas American kids had used it as a babysitter at the time. And Israeli kids hadn't had many books because in the early days of Israel, they just weren't available all that much, so they learned a lot on television, whereas American kids learned from books. Mm -hmm. 
So he gave kids the choice of whether they learned something from a book or from television, both Israeli and American kids. And what he found was that Israeli kids' view was that books were really easy to learn from and television was difficult. Mm. American kids had the opposite view. Oh, I can learn from you. Can somebody can let me watch TV? Thank you. I'll take that. Mm -hmm. And then he had groups that they were they were assigned. They weren't allowed to choose. Mm. What he learned was that the groups that weren't allowed to choose learned equally from both, more or less. There was a bit of a difference. But the kids that had chosen, the Israeli kids learned much more from books. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, they learned much more from television because they thought it was going to be difficult, was his view. Whereas the American kids learned much more from books, which they thought was going to be difficult. Yeah. And significantly less from television, which they thought was going to be easy. Hmm. So his conclusion, which by the way has been replicated 50 times since, mm -hmm. people didn't trust him, is that if you believe something is going to make learning easier for you, and or much more enjoyable, because the two are kind of equated, okay. it appears in most people's minds, you're going to invest less mental effort because we're all kind of economists at heart. Mm -hmm. The Minimax principle <laughs> guides yeah. our life unintentionally and automatically, and they, you just don't spend much effort at it. So while games appear to be fun, while people actually report having fun, they learn less, and it doesn't motivate them to actually learn more, to invest more effort, it appears that it might actually motivate them to invest less. less. So building fun into your learning experience is going to have a negative impact. If people feel that that fun is going to make it easier, I think the answer is pretty much yes. Okay. I'd hesitate to say that people have never learned from games. Sure. They certainly learn how to play the game. Mm -hmm. That's pretty evident. They could learn something other than that. I think they do. The question is, is it, if, if we're, our role with clients is always to actually advise them on what is the least expensive way to achieve the greatest amount of benefit, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Return on investment right. is huge. And in that regard, the return on investment from games is, is negative. It is not something that I would advise people to invest in. Mm -hmm. I have to say honestly, however, that the passion for games is so great that nobody listens to this, including the military. Mm -hmm. They took the study we did. They acknowledged that all the research that we reviewed was good research, nobody had a dispute about it, and they walked away and ignored it. We do have a tendency to do that, don't we? Don't we? Um, going back to your entree to uh, NSPI, ISPI back in the day, um, do you, I think you told me earlier that uh, some of the people that you initially met included Daryl Sink and Jeannie Farrington. And can you t tell us about uh, you also said that that led to you creating a, a program, a doctorate program. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah. Um, after a few years of coming to ISPI and meeting people and sort of getting more aware of what this HPT model was and being more and more excited about its prospects, I thought, well, this would be a terrific idea to create a professional doctoral program in, in, in HPT. So we did at the University of Southern California. Um, and in the, uh, the mid-90s, uh, mid to late 90s, we, uh, we, we started the program, had no trouble recruiting. We had a, a, a cohort of students up in the Bay Area. They were working for the dot-coms, mm -hmm. and we had a cohort down near San Diego, actually, that halfway between L.A. and San Diego that drew people from both areas. Mm -hmm. And a lot of really terrific people uh, went through that program. Matter of fact, I'm getting together with them next Friday. Uh -huh. we're, having a, we're having a reunion, so to speak. Ah. Um, some of those people have been, well, I think actually almost all of them have been continually involved here at, uh, at ISPI. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Hill, for example, is one of the students that went through the program. He's been uh -huh. president here, at, uh, he's past president, or we say former president at, uh -huh. at ISPI. <laughs> and uh, uh, Jeannie Farrington was one of the faculty in the mm -hmm. program, helped teach it. So uh, it was a great experience. It was not great for the for the School of Education, they got irritated because the students in the program began to be really critical about how the school was managed. Uh -huh. I mean, they began to say, well, you know, maybe we better start analyzing how the university's doing things. Universities, as you know, are not used to doing this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and irritated a few people. So after that program finished, they were not inclined to repeat it. Oh. 
uh, and actually, the program. No, no, they stopped the program. They oh. really turned it off. Now, whether it was because the students had gotten cranky or not, I don't know. <laughs> but it was highly successful in terms of the students. They liked it. They got, I think, a lot from it. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them graduated, uh, graduated quite quickly, actually. As you know, in universities, the big problem with doctoral programs is that people tend to hang around forever mm -hmm. uh, because of their work life and their family, whatever it is that distracts them. They have a hard time finishing. These people did not. And they've all done very well since then. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we learned a lot in that program. I mean, I have to credit them with a lot of my insights about. It. I mean, one of the greatest reasons to teach is that your students challenge you and they force you to do a better job of learning things and learn it deeper, so that you can be much more succinct and clear about it. I'm incredibly selfish about my motivation to continue being a professor. Uh, it's not about the status after a while, it's more than anything about what you can, you have to force yourself to learn, mm -hmm. to engage in really bright people that are there with the goal of challenging you every time you open your mouth. And uh, it's, it's an exciting exchange, of course, but I learned a huge amount from them. Mm -hmm. Well, one last question from me, uh, and that relates to your keynote speech here at the 2012 conference, the 50th anniversary of the Society. And uh, you raised the gauntlet, gave us the challenge to get back to evidence-based practice. And so for our audience here in, the, in this video series, uh, could you define what you mean by evidence? What, what constitutes evidence? There are, uh, there's a huge amount written about this, and uh, mostly I think because people that do research tend to overcomplicate things often. Or at mm -hmm. least, let's put it this way, they have a problem coming down and being succinct about what they do. Um, so people in medicine have been dealing with this for a very long time and their definition is one that I think I pretty much uh, accept, which is that it's an empirically verified statement of fact about the impact of some intervention in some context. Now empirical verification sort of begs for more of a definition. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, if you get online and ask this question, you'll find, you know, what will come up is a model that people in medicine have developed for what kinds of studies, what kinds of designs of both the experiments and the field studies and the evaluations that we do produce the evidence that lead to better decisions. A lot of people want to make the distinction between evidence, which comes out of experiments that are done where you try to rule out all other influences on an outcome except the intervention that you're studying, the problem you're trying to solve, or the problem you're trying to solve. And then, uh, and the decisions that you make as a result of that evidence. Mm -hmm. I have a model actually that, uh, that I've gotten excited about that I just talked about last week at the American Education Service. We talk about a model called our active ingredient model, mm -hmm. where we have a strategy for going into the results of the research that have been done, these empirical studies, that are well designed and trying to decide what was it about the intervention, what's called the treatment or whatever you want to call it, the solution mm -hmm. that they used, that actually made a difference. Because there's a huge amount of confusion out there about whether the evidence that's been created is about the vehicle that carried an intervention, such as, for example, a video, a computer program, a teacher that or a trainer that stood in front of a room, as mm -hmm. opposed to what that video, that teacher, that trainer, that multimedia actually presented or carried, the message, the way it was structured, the information that was given, how it was given. So this active ingredient thing is to try to get to, down to the elements of what happened. Mm -hmm. so the, and, and so the, there's what, two questions. One is, what's the evidence? In other words, was this so incredibly more successful than a viable, robust alternative mm -hmm. that it was compared with? And so what then caused the success is the second point of question. That is, what does the evidence tell us actually made a difference? And then there's a third issue, which is, okay, how do I decide whether in fact I'm going to implement this active ingredient that came out of all of this research? A great example, I think, if people want to take a look at it that's quite current, is a book by Rich Mayer, not out about evidence or research, don't mm -hmm. you? you know, it, but it's called multimedia learning. And what Rich does is describe the studies that were done for a series of principles that he's evolved 
to help people that are designing multimedia, uh, video presentations, interactive video, and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. to know what elements of those things hurt people's learning and what elements actually help and why. Mm -hmm. And he describes how the studies are designed, how they tease out these active ingredients, how they then use them in training studies, and then how they scale them gradually to make certain that they work. And I, I, I think that's what we don't do very often. Uh, when you look at a study, you can design a study to show pretty much what you like. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think that concerns me most is that a lot of studies in this field are designed by people that have a vested interest in the solution that they're trying to validate in the study. Mm -hmm. So we are a group of people who have a temptation to have solutions in search of problems to solve. When we need to make a transition to be a group of people who are consultants who want to solve problems and are open to any solution that's appropriate for our client that has the best evidence, that the evidence points us to the active ingredients that were there and so that we know how to take those active ingredients and implement them in a way that meets the values and the goals that our clients have. That's, I think, something that we're not doing. And I want to emphasize this. We have to avoid being people with solutions looking for problems. Mm -hmm. I've advocated that in the future we need to do research by getting people that totally disagree with each other together. If Because there are always competing approaches to things. Mm -hmm. And people on both sides do studies to prove that their approach works best, which is not what studies are designed to do. They're designed to show what works. Mm -hmm. So I want people that disagree to get together and design their solution to a problem, their different solutions, and agree about how they test and have those solutions compete in experiments. And then agree that if that to change their minds, if yes. it turns out their experiment doesn't work. This afternoon, uh, Harold Stolovich has got a session on miss in, in performance. I'm going to give a talk about the five things that I hated to give up when evidence over and over again just simply didn't support it. And I think if you're willing to do that, by the way, Dave Merrill was one of my mentors. David Merrill, the instructional designer, and one of the things that always attracted him to him as a kid was that this guy would change his mind in an instant if he saw evidence constantly go against something that he really believed was the case. I said, oh, I think I want to be like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's a common view. I think that's very hard to do. It's been hard for me, that's for certain. But if we can't do that, we're not going to grow as an organization or as people. Yeah, I think if we get invested in something, it's hard to let go, but that's what we need to do. We need to be open to the evidence as we learn more and uh, uh, go with that flow. Otherwise, we get stuck where we are, we don't change, and we become obsolete, literally. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you can't think of yourself as continually wanting to improve what you do, if an organization like ISPI is not willing to continue to take the next step, even no matter how large it is, no matter how scary it is, because change is always frightening, it's always difficult, but this organization has an opportunity if it goes back to its past. It started out being an evidence-based organization. The tent is maybe too large now, or maybe supporting things that, in my view, actually can make things worse mm -hmm. more often than it makes things better, or things that just don't work at all. Then, if we just set those things aside and focus on all these wonderful things that we do that actually do make an impact, we will stand out. Our brand will be, I think, incredibly visible. Dick, thank you for your challenge to the society, my professional home, and one of yours. Um, and uh, thank you for agreeing to share with us in this uh, video series. Guy, you're terrific to do this. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.